to the Jam Chow Jill podcast. I'm Jill of jamchowjill.com and I'm also, I wear sort of three key hats within my business. So I'm an eco-influencer on um, jamchowjill.com. I have a virtual assistant services business. So if anyone needs any help in their business with support in marketing and email marketing, social media, please give me a shout on that front. And then this third hat, is running this podcast, which all specialises around discussions around holistic health, which is such a passion of mine. I've been through my own stuff with insomnia, anxiety, ongoing stuff like that. And I just love talking to people about a more natural way to deal with health through different specialisms. Today, we have a wonderful guest, Sorrel Pinder who I met through MK Collaborate, who is my local networking group. And she is a mental wealth coach. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about her. So um, she's currently working as a wellbeing coach with a focus on mental health and relationships. She has a particular interest in boarding school survivors, as she is one herself. Until last May, she also worked as an osteopath with a specialism in treating people with ME and CFS and long COVID. She learned a lot from those particular patients and wants to discover how early trauma often plays a part in chronic illness later in life. So that all sounds fascinating. So we're just going to go into today everything that Sorrel does and walk through different examples with a focus on how to plan best for the year ahead as our example piece. So welcome to the podcast, Sorrel. Lovely to yes, have thank you. Thank you. Me, Jill. Do you want to start with a quick bio in your own words as such? So um, where are you from? Where do you currently live? How did you end up there? Who do you live with? And what do you do in your own words? Okay, where I'm from, I come from a little town called Petswood, which is on the edge of London into Kent. Not far from Brighton, which is probably the place people are more like to know. And at the age of 11, I went to boarding school in Hartford. So not a million miles from here, actually. Hmm. And um, spent seven years there. And after that, I lived all over the place, actually. Hmm. And I ended up in Bedford, having spent five years in Brussels with my now ex-husband, um, where we went for his job. And with two small children, we ended up in Bedford really quite by chance. We were looking for a place to live where there would be work for him locally and he decided that there was going to be work for him here. And as it turned out, there was work in Watford, which was a bit of a, a trek from Bedford, but hey mm. Um And so I've, I've just kind of put roots down here and, and ended up here. My daughters have both grown up now and left home and live one in Oxford and one in, in London. And I currently have a semi-attached relationship. So okay. my brother, he, he has his own place. He's a, he's an artist and it's his studio, and yeah. there's no thing in painting in my house because I'm my OCE is too much for that. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so we spend the weekends together, and he goes back to the studio on Monday morning. That sounds wonderful arrangement to me. <laughs> Great arrangement, yeah. and he always picks on a Tuesday, so I'm always always having a dinner with him on a Tuesday evening, and and it works really nicely. That sounds perfect. I think this is the thing we get, I think in our youth, we often kind of follow a specific linear description of what a relationship should be. And sometimes oh, yes. in um, secondary relationships, we kind of question the status quo a bit. And I think that's a brilliant thing, yeah, really. It's really it? true, Jill. And, you know, it's funny, I'll be listening to the radio sometimes, I think... Mm. You say, why do you say things like that? There's songs that come out of the 1980s and the, mm. and the 90s. They just full of so much bullshit about relationships. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and I think, you know, like you could sort of take them all to court and sue them for the kind of rubbish they put about that's made people unhappy. Yeah. yeah. I think, you know, I almost didn't question it and question all the things which I just did because I just thought it was the right thing to do um, until I read the follow-up book to Eat, Pray, Love, which is called Committed. It's by Liz uh -huh. as well. Yeah. 
and her and it's a fascinating book because obviously if you've seen the film she ends up with Felipe at the end of the film and that was mm-hmm. true to her life as well and they uh, were both divorcees and both had no intention of getting married ever again because they yeah. both had quite horrible divorces and and they had this arrangement where he was a jewelry importer or a gems importer and she was a writer mm-hmm. she's based in America he was from Brazil and they worked around the visa system in that he'd come and he'd live with her for three months and then he'd have to yeah. leave the country again and yeah. blah 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 and long story short all the rules changed in immigration in America I think it might have been when Bush was in or something like that and um suddenly the only way that they could continue their relationship and him coming to stay with her Mm -hmm. the only option they gave her was for them to get married yeah and um and then she goes into this whole piece it's fascinating book around the history of marriage and why marriage and all these oh, different yeah. things. And it's absolutely a fascinating book to read. It's absolutely brilliant. And her initial reaction when she literally goes to pick him up from immigration is, um, well, can't, can't I just hire him as an employee? Because I'd rather do that than marry him. <laughs> because she had so much trauma around <laughs> the whole concept of marriage. But it was fascinating as well because she went into the history of both Western marriage and Eastern marriage and how it had very different connotations as well. Yes, yes. Um, But, yeah, as I say, it's just a fascinating book because I think we – there's so many things and I kind of feel like that's coming out in society. I won't go off on too much of a tangent here. (laughs) But around all the things which are givens – you know, and I kind of feel like the current generation is suddenly questioning them all. And our... yeah, the other thing I'd say about this, Jill, is and I remember when things were really bad with my ex. I don't know how I came across it, but I found a book by a German psychotherapist called Love Yourself and It Doesn't Matter Who You Marry. Oh, I love she that was practice. saying is that the things that go wrong in relationships are the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Yeah. And what is in the water is your own stuff. It's yeah. the stuff that you brought with you. And it starts in childhood. And, and making for a note of that book. Boarding school, you get even even more stuff. I yeah, say. I bet you do. Yeah. And and you until you start to recognize how that's impacting on the way you relate to other people, you're kind of helpless in the face of it. Yeah. And that's what happened for me is when I met Mark as my current partner, we are both boarding school survivors and we both had a series of pretty disastrous relationships. Mm. I speak for mostly, but anyway. Mm. And we both worked out what we've been doing wrong. Mm. And then that position, I, I have constantly have to pull myself, pull myself back and say, no, Sorrel, you're just being argumentative. Let him say his piece and don't keep interrupting him. Because I know that's an old pattern that mm. we're shaking off, but I also know it doesn't help. Yeah. And yeah. the most important thing is just the connection. What's more important, getting the washing up done the way you like it or having a really lovely connection with your partner? Yeah, yeah. I think there's so much stuff, but I think it's only kind of post-children as well that I truly understand that the most important relationship is with your, yourself with yourself and yeah. and I think that's something which you do have you talk about controlling the controllables that's something that yes, you exactly. always have control over is learning to love yourself a bit more and a bit more and yes. be kinder to yourself be kind to yourself and, absolutely and it's also segmenting that as well like I listened to a podcast recently um of a marriage which broke up and um she was saying how she relearned to love her body and rather than blaming her body for all these different things and saying oh you're fat or oh you're this or you yeah. let me down because the and she's like she read this book I can't remember what the book was now but it was like oh or to understand that your body's only goal is to keep you safe yes and if you can get your head around that that actually all the things which it's trying to do 
it's all to try and keep you safe yes. in the best way it knows how. Life is confusing and all the different layers of society which now are piled on top of us, you know, the actual core self gets so confused and that's why we get into like fight or flight for something which and, doesn't need to, you know. And and I think people confuse two things. They confuse the core, the core self with their personality and they're not the same. Yes. Personality is made up of all those messages we got from our parents and our school friends and our sibling mm. teachers and then partners and husbands and wives. But they're very often not true. Mm. And when you start to strip those away and get into who you really are underneath, that's where the power lies. It's fascinating. Yeah, the podcast I was listening to yesterday um which is my favourite at the moment, the Glennon Doyle, We Can Do Hard Things. And um, they were kind of going into the difference between politeness and kindness. And yes. politeness comes from smoothing out, like if you actually look at the linguistics of the word, being mm -hmm. polite is all about smoothing whatever you're talking about to make it as digestible as possible to everyone in the room. But that's not yeah. necessarily... Um, due to your own perceptions whereas it's yeah. not actually necessarily being kind you know and you could be like yeah I mean it just blows your mind there's just so much there's I guess so if pol politeness comes from a fear of judgment hmm. or a fear of disapproval then it's not being true to yourself is it yeah it's true also, it's not being kind because sometimes we need to tell people stuff they don't really want to hear but hmm. when are willing to open up and listen and yeah then they change and, and grow absolutely it's so fascinating right so i just want to um delve into the osteopath thing just briefly and okay. and, and why did you decide to go into that and why did you decide to come out <laughs> <of that>? just, <laughs> okay i went into it because my eldest daughter or my i've only got the two girls she had a really difficult birth mm. and as a as a new well from like early early in her life probably one or two weeks old until well we finally got her to an osteopath I'm trying to remember now I think she was about maybe six to eight weeks old mm. but she didn't sleep mm. she would cry mm. until three or four in the morning oh, but I was just to the osteopath on the advice of a friend and it was a place in London called the Osteopathic Centre for Children, mm -hmm. so specialists. And they did this incredible treatment, which is, I mean, it looks like they're not doing anything at all, actually. Yeah, yeah. So subtle and so nuanced. And and it was like a miracle. That night she was asleep by 11 o'clock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've heard we, so many, you know, like, people, because I've got a friend who's got a baby with colic at the moment, and so many people have said, yeah, baby osteopath solved it. absolutely i would recommend okay. to anyone who's got a baby who doesn't sleep or cries who's got colic or any of those things take them to an osteopath and the same for like ear infections and those sorts of things what's so mad though is it's not considered a mainstream specialism and it's not covered by 99 percent of the nhs and that no, it's not. drives um, me insane because it's a lot more mainstream. mainstream but julie it's a lot more mainstream yeah. does things mm -hmm. and um so you have to be registered to call yourself an osteopath otherwise you could be prosecuted yes and yet you're right it isn't funded by the nhs but then the nhs is in crisis anyway yes they are so why did you then decide to sort of move on from the oh, well, i've been doing it for nearly 20 years yeah um, and do you specialize in babies or do you special or do no, you I so no. at the beginning, I just was general generalist. I've treated yeah. a few small children in the past. I think the youngest I ever treated was two, maybe four. I can't remember. Yeah. It wasn't my thing. And there was another osteopath in, in Bedford where I live who was a child special, children and baby specialist, and I'd always refer people to her unless it was something really straightforward. I ended up specialising in treating people with chronic fatigue syndrome because, well, it, that again was like, just coincidence, really. Mm. Believe in coincidence. I think it's all synchro destiny. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So that was interesting. And yeah. that started 
2007. So I started practicing in 2002. And in 2007, I had my first ME patient. I did some extra training um, with this guy called Ray, Raymond Perrin, who he's developed this whole method for, for treating ME. So um, just quickly, mm -hmm. um, chronic fatigue syndrome and ME, yeah. can they be That's one in the same? Or? They're the same, more or less the same thing. I... Okay. And is it your belief that both of them come from mental trauma and the body exhibits stuff from that trauma or is so that it that's this kind of nice little simplification yeah yeah it, what i would say in general is that it is not true that everyone i ever treated with me had childhood trauma but the vast majority did and it wasn't necessarily really serious trauma it didn't mm -hmm. have to use for anything but it could just be that dad was away for work a lot of the time and mom was a bit depressed and wasn't very emotionally available mm -hmm. yeah and and as we now know children who suffer trauma or how, who are kind of parented in a not particularly brilliant fashion should we say mm. they regulate their own emotions mm -hmm. and so when they get stressed or when things that might not be stressful to, to you or me but are stressful to to them I mean you know the stress is what we experience in our minds it's not the thing outside of us then their stress response come becomes overactive so you get either too much fight and flight or you get they go into freeze so some people barely able to get out of bed they're not in fight or flight they've burned out to the point that they're they're in freeze response yes so that's, that's fascinating. terms I guess so they're much more likely to to get ill with a right. trigger like COVID. Because their immune system is run down. And the, um, I mean, this is a fascinating thing I always come back to on my podcast of holistic health. To me, holistic health is broadly two things. Yeah. In that it's both talking about natural, more natural ways to deal with your health. Sure. But the other exciting and very relevant thing is looking at your body holistically and how oh, yeah. everything connects to one another. And that's something which I feel in the standard medical model is quite often missed because Not they're then firefighters. It's, it's and then they go, she's got a headache, so it must be all about her head, you know, yeah. you know, rather than looking at the whole thing, which yeah. I think holistic specialists naturally just go ahead and do do you know what I mean so I find it hot, so fascinating what you're saying about how your body because people talk about how your muscle have memory and and how you hold emotions in your muscles and I think there's still so much that we don't know about all of that you know it's it's quite mind-blowing really right how did you come to the fact that were you just talking to them doing your osteopathy? Oh, and so okay. So how when did you, you find that pattern, what yeah. happened was when you train with Ray Perrin, he gives you a formula, a format, format mm. for in the case history, and you start with their birth, mm. and you find out were there any birth complications, were there any complications in the pregnancy. And you ask them things like, did you grow up in the town or in the country? You want to find out whether they've been affected by pesticides, for instance. Mm. You go through early childhood, middle childhood, adolescence, adulthood. And you say, you ask them like, oh, so, you know, what happened when you were a baby? Were you a, were you a healthy baby? Were you sickly? What was, it, what was your family life like? And you don't probe. You don't say, well, you know, did your dad beat you up? Clearly not. No. The kind of questions that makes it possible for them to say, oh, yeah, my dad was a bit of a violent man or my mum was really depressed. Mm. And I also, I just say, you know, did you experience any trauma? Because that could just be falling off your bicycle and breaking your wrist, you know. Mm. So, question. And so, and so it comes out in that first case history. And then very often more things will come out because it, it's not something that's a, it's not a quick fix for a lot of well, my patients. I think sometimes it, it's... Yeah. it's through having someone who asks you the probing questions that you suddenly realise and you connect the dots. Yes. And 
Oh, yes, okay. absolutely. You know, when you were talking just now, and, and I might cut this out or not, but I just, I had this just epiphany that I was talking to my hypnotherapist friends just on the school run the other day and yeah. saying how I, I always have something about how I don't like people holding my neck and I don't, like, I don't, I actually said to him, and I've wondered this, like, I don't know if it's a past life thing, I was strangled or, you know, mm-hmm. I just, I really have a thing about anything like, around my neck do you know what I mean and just as you were talking about birth trauma Mm -hmm. I just connected the dots that I was born with the cord wrap around my neck oh wow Jill Uh, and I literally there was a story where I came out blue and what they did in 1983 was they unwrapped the cord held me upside down and whacked my bum until I screamed and that's and that's what they did I don't, I very much doubt they do that nowadays, but oh, maybe. Who knows? Do, but, <laughs> but I've never connected that before. That's crazy. Yeah. How? Well, it, that is interesting, actually, that it was just in that moment you made that connection. And I, I remember patients said, would say to me, that is the very first time I've ever told anybody my entire life history from the very beginning. Yeah. In the order. Of course, we don't. Because people don't think to ask. And I think that's amazing. And and just interestingly, do you look at the zero to seven thing? Because I've heard yeah. that of other specialists, that that is the key window yeah. where. So that's actually a psychology thing, is it? What yeah. is psychology? But it, it's holistic. <laughs> like, Sorry. Bless you in your cough. It's psychology and it's, it's you know, physical physiology because it's all it's all linked mm. and some of that early stuff is pre-verbal so there is there were no words to lay down with the memory with so the memory has to be entirely physical and um, yeah it's it but actually to, t- to tell your story and make those connections in itself mm. is kind of starting the healing process so you were saying the strategy is to literally track their history from birth and then you quite often tap into things. Yes, because as you as they tell their story, mm. you spot things that would give would be risk factors, if you like, for developing ME or long COVID. Mm. And then you can point them out to the patient. Mm. Oh, that would have made you more likely to develop ME. Mm. You can see those connections and make sense of why they've become ill. And then the other really important thing was for them to recognise that very often they got ill following a period of extreme overwork. Mm. Working working maybe slightly more than normal hours, but doing a lot of sport. Mm. And quite often that in itself was a response to the trauma because... Mm-hmm. The trauma is that serious. You can't spend have any time in your day to think about it. You have to be constantly distracting yourself. Go, go, things. go. Yeah, work is a great distraction from trauma. I, I've been down that road. Mm. Yeah, so, keep yourself busy so you don't yeah. so you don't think too much. Yeah. Mm. But um, it's, it's all yeah. a balancing act, isn't it? It's a balancing act where... You know, that's healthy behaviour to a degree, but when it gets obsessive, it's obviously... It's healthy. It is kind of what I would say now, which I probably did not recognise back then, is that it was your own wisdom keeping you safe in the only way it knew how. Yeah. In the end, you've if you don't want to burn out, you have got to face your fears. You have got to take the time, hopefully with somebody who can you know, hold the space for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and and you asked me why I've stopped doing osteopathy. Mm-hmm. And so during the, the lockdown of 2020, I reconfigured my week. So yeah. I had two days As of we week all week. did. <laughs> well, yes, everybody did. But for me, I was allowed to work. I was allowed to, to treat. <laughs> it's interesting. Urgent and emergency cases. So for a while, I had two young women who both said, I cannot cope if I don't come for my treatments or mm. so they, they came on a Thursday. 
And then as we were allowed to, to treat ordinary, not non-urgent cases, yes, I really forget my week. So I worked Tuesdays and Thursdays in the clinic doing the osteopathy and the rest of the week was doing coaching. Mm. And I built up my coaching practice. And then two years on, I thought, I just cannot sustain running two practices side by side. Mm. So I decided and it was time to retire from osteopathy. So I did. So how and when did you do the coaching training? Was that through? That was started in 26, 26, yeah, 2016. Mm. So it is a massive thing in my life. My ex decided that the marriage was over in 2014, moved mm. into the room. And I finally got out in 2016, two years mm. later. So that was difficult that time. Um, once I'd got my own place and was on my own, I had that feeling that I could now do what was right for me. Mm -hmm. It was an NLP course I did. A, um, it was actually a self-coaching NLP course, which is quite interesting. And I did that NLP. Tell me what that yeah, is. Ne Neuro-linguistic programming. Okay, just give us a top level what that means. <laughs> <laughs> if you can <laughs> okay it's oh goodness it's based around language mm -hmm. based around the idea that all of our ex what what we what comes into us from the outside is filtered because it has to be we we can't be available to all the data coming in and that we, we build models of the world and they're very much language based mm. And you can change how you behave or how you feel by by changing the way you think and perceive and so on. I remember us talking about this in one of our previous calls now because I was telling you about the um, looking into the hypnotherapy stuff and and the retraining your mind yeah. to, with different narratives and how and you were saying how when you're doing a consult with someone that you really listen to how they describe their problems yes as that gives you real sort of keys as to where it comes from and such and how they think about it yeah and um, one of the really valuable things in NLP is the concept of maps okay. so there's a lovely example of Japanese maps they don't name their streets they name the blocks right I've never been to Japan, but this is what I've been told. And if you go to Japan and you ask for a, you know, well, which street do I need to go to, to, to go, I know, to go to the bank or the post office or whatever, then what, what, what are you talking about? It's on block, block, you know, X, Y, Z. Yeah. And so for us to process that kind of information about spatial layout, if you like, of a city, yeah. through naming blocks rather than naming streets, it just seems very alien. Yeah. And it's the same with our world in general. So, for instance, there are people who, who take a map from one context to another. So um, classic case is somebody who's a manager at work who then comes home with his manager map, always like his manager hat on. Mm. It's his wife and children as if they he was managing them too. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Rather than stepping out of the manager map, in, map, map into the husband and father map. Okay. Yeah. But this isn't a personality, it's a map. Well, the whole thing around personality is, is a, a big... Is a big... <laughs> anyway, I mean, I, my my map of personality... Yeah. It's, some, it's something we've constructed. Mm -hmm. It's a purpose. So I have a boarding school survivor's personality, which I am in the process of changing. Mm -hmm. That is functional as an adult. Yeah. But because because we think well, far, the first problem is that a lot of us think of personality as fixed and unchangeable, which it is not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the second problem is that we're very often aware of these patterns anyway. It's like we kind of enact them on a daily basis without being aware of what we're doing. Yeah. Um, and it comes into that whole part of you know you have thoughts, you not your thoughts aren't you, <laughs> no, you're, not, you're, you're not your thoughts. No, you're not your thoughts. And, so going back to the whole core self distinction, mm. yeah, your core self is what's experiencing the thoughts that your mind is creating. Mm. You're not your mind. Yeah. Your mind 
part of your human body that you are you are inhabiting. Okay, it's a bit spiritual. Yeah. But the, the old saying that we are not human beings having a spiritual experience, we yeah. are spiritual beings having a human experience. Yeah. 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 I the love human experience is the mind. Yeah. 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 So when you see it that way, it all looks very different. So that's a different map. It's a different model. Yeah. I guess how do you then go in and and adjust the ones which aren't working? Oh, okay. So what I found to be really helpful is to recognize that all minds and all thoughts, all minds make things up. Mm-hmm. Everything, everything we think, feel, believe, perceive, everything is made up. It's all created by the mind. Mm. Mm. And therefore nothing, I don't privilege my thinking over anybody else's. I mean, obviously sometimes I think, oh my goodness, that's absolute bullshit. But I also know that I'm not some amazing person whose thoughts are always right. How could I be? I'm just one of seven or eight billion people. So they're all opinions. Would that be a correct term? You can put it like the way if you like. Yeah. Except that I wouldn't call my visual perception of my God an opinion, but in a way it is an opinion. Yeah. I know that if somebody who was an insect specialist was to go into my garden, they'd see a bunch of insects that I don't even see. Yeah. 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 That's weird random. I always talk about my garden because I'm looking at it at the good time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, when it comes to relationships, it becomes really critical because if I privilege my model of the world over my partner, mm. the world, we're a bit enough really, isn't it? Yeah, it's true. His model like, comes from we naturally do that though i think with we all do things. exactly it's like with I, the whole without going down a tangent i won't but um with the whole love languages thing of oh, yeah. we naturally want to receive what we give and actually yes. understanding that someone else has a different thing like that's yeah. different to someone else and actually for someone else to hear that you, or feel that you love them, they need to hear it in their love language, not in your love language. And, uh, you know, that kind of thing. I find well, you know funny. what, actually? I know that's the, class, the classic um, um, interpretation of love languages. Mm. So, but I also now recognise that if my partner shows me love in his love language, mm. that's probably the most authentic way he has of showing me. Yes. So yes. it's actually down to you to learn what his love language is so you can hear when he's speaking to you in yes. it or showing you exactly. in it and, yeah. and appreciate what he's sending to you and how it's coming to you, you know, rather mm-hmm. than trying to adapt. Yeah. 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 And, and, stuff. yeah, so you kind of wanting to meet in the middle of it because obviously it's nice if he sometimes shows me in my love language. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I'm not going to dismiss anything that he does in his love language because that would be stupid, wouldn't it? Yeah, it's true. It's true. Yeah, yeah it's. Uh, I I find gratitude journaling really helpful with this because sometimes actually reviewing events of the day at the end of the day and yes. recognizing, oh, he did that for me. Oh, that was actually an act of love. You know, that's yes. it's a nice way to kind of go, huh? Okay, I see that. You know. So yes, that's, that's the useful. That's the next question I have is actually, um, what formats do you use to work with people? Do you do one to ones workshops, webinars? Um, you know, so if you could just speak to that yeah. quickly. So I do one to one work. I have a women's group coaching program, which is has been focused around goals actually, which is what we we're going to talk about. Mm-hmm. And I'm currently working on a group program for boarding school survivors with another coach who's a man. So you could work with women and men. And (laughs) another thing in the pipeline, which is with another female coach, um, looking at saying boundaries and saying no. Mm. We'd be doing a two day program thing. Yeah. Probably in April. I'm not sure of the dates yet. Um, So there's lots of exciting stuff in the pipeline. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I love doing group coaching. Because the interaction between the me- the members of the group adds so much. Yeah, on top okay. of you get one to one. 
So do you mainly work with women, do you, yourself? I do mostly, but I, I do work with men sometimes, but I seem to attract way more women clients than men. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I think it's funny, isn't it? Because I always think when I think about the possibilities of any sort of um, therapy that I'd rather do it with a woman. Um, yeah. I just think we innately kind of understand each other on some level. I know we it's probably do. a bit of a sweeping statement, but... I've done both. And I have to say, if you pick the right man, mm. they think something that that you're not going to get from a woman because they simply see the world from the other side of the, the male-female divide, if you like. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. So if someone was to come to you as a new client, how would you assess how to help them? Uh, okay. So I have um, a series of questions I ask in the very first session. Um, which is it's come to me from one of many, which a women's coach is a women's coaching organization who I trained with. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just, a, and I've never changed it. They're such powerful questions, and they they look at they get you to look at what your current challenge is, which is why you're here for coaching, and then look for the parallels in your past mm. and see the connections, and then just like you know, so what are you prepared to do about this, and how committed are you? to make as you're going to need to make um and that generally takes about an hour sometimes a bit longer so it's quite in depth so the thing is if someone is to seek a coach they're probably in a kind of proactivity place in their head that yes. they want yes. to take ownership of whatever their problem is yes. um different from say therapy or perhaps or um mentorship you know um there's different sort of things for different people, I guess, at different stages or um, yeah. confidence levels as well. I mean, coaching to me is a lot more about person, you take ownership of the thing. What are you willing to do in order to move forward with yeah. this? The steps I'll guide you through. I'll say you're doing well as we're going. I'll, you know, feedback. So, and- I th- coaching comes in different forms and I ne- almost never tell anyone what they need to be doing. Mm. It's down to sometimes people want to say, well, can you give me some advice, please? Mm. I'm reluctant because mm. you can give people advice and they will not take it. And, and it would have probably been wrong for them in the first place. Mm. So it is about and it is about taking ownership. You're right about that. Mm. And it's about recognising that you, you, the client, create your own world anyway. Mm. living at the moment is it with your creation I mean you know I could blame things on my ex but the truth of the matter was that I chose to stay with him but mm. have him I could have left him sooner I created that mm. that's that's a tough a tough pill to swallow as they say well yeah. it isn't it isn't because once I recognized that I couldn't blame him for my what was going wrong in my life mm. well that power and a control that I could actually change everything and it gave me back okay, so it gives you closure once you accept it yes exactly well is that too yeah i'll never get complete closure i don't think but that's okay i can live with that that's cool cool okay um so i just wanted to talk into the example we decided to go into today and i want to be sort of open with the audience in that we are recording this in february we've just yes. come out of the most gray a miserable January going <laughs> as far as I'm concerned in the last few years like I literally haven't not been sick um, for the whole time <laughs> and the weather has been bloody awful and we're feeling what? all very miserable and everything like that and it just then speaks to this whole piece just briefly around us setting ourselves new year's resolutions oh, yes. for the new year and how this whole trend of Oh, like, let's go back to the gym. Let's do this. Let's do that. Blah, blah, blah. And and what I find so interesting and what I love about, uh, like, we're releasing, this episode is going to be released in April, I think. We I agreed. think that's what we said. I think that's right. So that's springtime. Yes. And actually, what I love again about the holistic space is that whole connection to nature. 
And yes. the fact that actually let's pay attention to what nature is doing rather than what capitalism Absolutely. is doing. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, actually, be more like the hedgehog, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a concept I learned about, and I love this whole idea of seasons, the metaphor of seasons in all sorts mm. of different ways. And something which I learned about, which I really wish was taught to girls or people with periods in school, <laughs> is the metaphor of seasons for the menstrual cycle. Oh, yes. Uh, because That's I learned awful. about this in women's wellness yoga, and it blew my mind mm. that actually this whole piece around when you're on your period, that's your winter. And yes. you, you should be nurturing yourself. You should yes. be looking after yourself. You should be hot water bottles and stodgy food, and there's no shame in any of that. Absolutely. Because that is what your body needs at that point. And then when you come out the other end, then you go into ovulation, which is spring. And yes, then, exactly. And then you get energy and you want to, you know. And and you want to have sex, you know, and because suddenly. Things, you know, yes. and just having that as a grounding of going, oh, I'm not a crazy person. I actually have a cycle. It's a cycle. It's a cycle. <laughs> Yeah, Jill, that's so interesting you brought this up because the one of many coaching, women's coaching thing, mm. is all based around that cycle. Mm. And it takes you through these, what well, she calls them power types, but they're like archetypes. And and the springtime one, which is what, when this podcast is going to be coming out, is the lover part of the cycle. Yeah. Is it just about having more sex, which is great, yeah. Yeah. also about looking after yourself and caring for yourself? Yeah. And then you move into mother. Yeah. Actually, I'm wrong. The first one is warrior S. She comes probably around February, March, actually, mm. as you're coming out of out of your menstruation before you hit ovulation. Um, and kind of coming back to the thing about the New Year's resolutions, mm. you, you're right. That's the that's the season when you would be in sorceress, mm. which is reflecting probably being a bit on your own and not hanging out with people too much being a bit mm. as you would be when you're having a naughty nasty period yeah or when you're in that pre pre-menstrual phase you know when you've got ghastly pmt and you just want to hear everyone um yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so stress is all about retreating and hibernating and reflecting and so what i wanted to say about this whole new year's resolutions nonsense and mm. i think it's nonsense is that it's the worst time to commit to doing something. Yeah. The sex, all you want to do is curl up on a sofa with a good book and a glass, a mug of hot chocolate. And we, we need to embrace that. Yeah. We need to embrace, you know, yeah, we need to embrace so that. Is, like coming to me from so many different directions at the moment. But the other, about the other the thing. About the importance of rest, you know. It's the importance of rest, exactly. It's okay and it's a, to rest. And it's actually. Oh, oh my God, tell me about it. part of the cycle is learning to rest, to restore, yes. to actually refill your cup in that way before you then dive into your next project. And actually yeah. this whole cyclical way of living life, you know, rather than a linear straight up the hill line, is far more natural for human beings yes, it in is. general. It is far more natural. And the one thing I'd say about the whole new resolutions thing is i say just stop and reflect take the rest go in and do a bit of hibernating be more hedgehog and reflect and with the, the with the group coaching program the first woman who she, she and i set it up together because she said to me do you do group coaching and i said well i've been thinking about it and yes I can. of course i can mm. and she said, I want to work on goals mm. and accountability so we started it and I said, okay, before we do goals, we're going to do values. Mm. And this is this is the period now, we're in February, aren't we? Yeah. Work on your values. By the time this gets out in, in the public space, it's going to be April, but still not too late. Work on your values, look at your values. And if you just make a list of the things that are important to you, and I don't mean things like, I mean, not things, but notions, ideas, Stuff that's important to us that you can't. Can you give us some examples of the kind? Oh, um, uh, success, love, um, security, 
family. So family is a value. Your children are not a value. Because mm. I'm in a wheelbarrow. But you can't put love, success and family in a wheelbarrow. Mm. So the things which are important to you, write them all down. And then go back and say, well, is this really my value or did I inherit it from my parents or from my sp- my spouse or my sister? And be really clear about which ones are your values and which ones are ones you've inherited and taken on because then you can cross those ones off. But can it also be if if you inherited it but it is serving you, then it becomes... Oh, yeah, value. sure. Then it's your, still your value. Yeah. I mean, I've inherited values from my parents that I wouldn't cross off the list because I, yeah, because it it's, it's serving you well, yeah, yeah. But, but the things definitely. which don't serve you well, you can exactly. happily cross off. Right, got you. Yeah. Got and you. then you then you use your your values to inform your goals. Oh, nice. And your intentions, and I tend I would start more with intentions, which are a little bit vaguer than goals. Okay. It, if I decided that, um, I think a good example now. Well, I know why I could have an intention at the beginning of the year or in, in April that I want to improve my relationship with my children. Right. Yeah, that's quite vague. Yeah, it is vague. It's quite from a goal of like, okay, I'm going to commit to phoning them twice a week. So that would be the goal. Be a goal, wouldn't it? Right. So the goal is the specific. So the value is is the thought, is the the value is... Okay, so the value, so with this example, the value there will be connection. Right. In connection with relationship with my daughters, but it's connection. Right. I have with my partner, my children, my close friends. Um, And then what am I going to do about that? How am I going to get more connection in my life? Well, because I'm going to improve my relationship with my daughters. I'm going to hang out more with my friends. And then from that, in those intentions, I can then look at how to kind of, what's the word you would use? Operationalize it. Mm. Yeah. So that's something you could almost measure and say, yeah, I, I did or I did not manage to call my daughters twice a week. Yeah. Or I did or did not manage to see my, my best friend every once a month, you know, whatever it might be. Yeah. Work on values first. Question which are your own and which are inherited, which serve you and which doesn't, cross That's off right. the list ones which don't serve you, then go on to intentions, wider it's thoughts. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I think we all have a fairly clear idea of what a goal is, but mm. we're not clear what we mean by intention. Mm. I would say if you can't grasp the notion of intention, go to vision. What's your, you know, what would be your vision for the end of the year? And, and to be able to sort of have almost like a picture in your mind of what you're aiming for like a vision board whether that be physical kind of like or a vision board. Yeah. yeah yeah okay and make it real make it so that the kind of neuroscience is that the more real it is in terms of what you can see hear smell feel the more likely it is that you will create that reality put all your senses behind it yeah absolutely Okay, and then intentions are wider, wider thoughts about or adaptions you want to make. I think the difference between a goal and an intention is basically that goals tend to be very specific. Like oh. I see my daughters twice a week. Yeah. Whereas an intention is a bit bigger than that. Yeah. I think the the example of connecting with your children and then how is a is a good is a yeah. good way to measurable action. Yeah. Action. Specific, measurable action. So, I mean, I think that's a really great way of of doing it as well because you kind of do it piecemeal and you work through rather than just mm. saying, "I'm going to start going to the gym five days a week" or something like that. I'm going to keep to you know. It's actually within this as well, learning to be kind yeah. to yourself. It is about that, that too. That sometimes you might have a week where you're sick and you don't feel up to an hour's conversation with your kids. But maybe that week you can dr- make sure you drop them a it, note or, you know, adapt it as you go. It's, it's interesting, Jill, because I think it was before Christmas I had a conversation with a guy I met networking and he 
he wanted to start going to the gym every, I think it was every day. Mm. And, and he said, but, you know, quite often I get up in the morning and I think, oh, I can't be bothered going to the gym. So I don't go. And then I feel guilty. And mm. I beat up and I said, well, do you think you're more likely to go the next day if you beat yourself up and felt guilty about not going today? And he said, no, I yeah. probably don't. Yeah. You know, it's, you've just taken a day at a time, a step at a time, and and maybe something a little bit more achievable, like going three times a week is a good place to start. Yeah. And once you've got that established, then you can, if you think it's going to be helpful to go five days a week, then you I'll can go. go once a week, you know? <laughs> I never go to the gym at all. I hate gyms. Well, is that the right exercise for you? You know, question. And all of those sorts of things. Well, you know, he clearly wanted, I think he'd already been to the gym a few times and knew that he he enjoyed it enough. But it's just getting himself off there in the morning before he started work. So I find, I find for me when I'm setting these kind of things, you know, I'm working through this process with a um, business coach at the moment for sorting mm-hmm. out my business. And I guess if I use your framework here, so I'll, I, I kind of my intention is to make my business more businessy this year. <laughs> oh right, okay. <laughs> and and, and like to that. use more of a business mindset and a growth mindset and learn what that truly means. And yes. and, and look at it, you know, in terms of how can I reach the financial goals, how can I reach the success goals, I guess, which yes you know but having that help from the outside of people who are business people um yes to kind of like bring that in and that's why I'm seeking stuff through like SEMLEP and the NatWest Accelerator program and such um to kind of get that guidance in that space so Jill if you if your intention is to make your business more businessy which I love (laughs) what goals does that translate into well, my coach at the moment, he like we've literally broken down how many hours a week I need to work in order to reach this financial goal a month and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Because in the first instance, you know, as a startup, it is very much unfortunately about that. And it is about, you know, mm-hmm. getting to the point where I'm making enough that I'm not having to rely on savings or I'm not having to do these things. But then I say to him as well that about the kindness piece and the wellness piece and the not putting too much pressure on myself and triggering my anxiety piece as well, which I'm all aware of all those things to making those mistakes in the past, that actually I'd rather say, you know, my bare minimum I need to make is X. And for that, it's relatively small how many hours Mm -hmm. a day I need to work. Mm -hmm. My ideal is why, and that would be wonderful if I got to that, but I don't have to get to that. And to me to have the space, and I don't know if this works in your um, coaching (laughs) (laughs) coaching. piece as well, Um, but to have a sliding scale of success, um, I think it's a really helpful thing. Yes, actually, you still feel successful, even if you've managed this. Yes. So do you know what I'm saying? Yes, I know exactly what you mean. You make it to the gym five days a week. If you've made it to the gym, you know, it's making it small enough and bite sized enough. So that's interesting, Jill, because I remember I did um, some business coaching a while back and they talked about a moving needle target. Mm. And I set myself some financial goals and I can't remember what they were anymore, but, you know, maybe the lower one was 30,000 a year and the top one was 80,000 a year and there was something yeah. in the middle. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if I hit 30,000, I'd be happy. Yeah. If I hit, hit 100,000, I'd be overjoyed, you know. Yeah. But the other the other side of it is this thing about, you know, okay, so this week I'm going to go to the gym once. And when I've done that, I shall feel great. Yeah. And then this week I might go twice. Yeah. And there's this lovely saying from a, a writer, an American science fiction writer called E.L. Doctorow, and he talks about the process of writing being like driving in the fog. You have you can only see as far as your headlights, your fog light will show you, but it's enough to make the entire journey. 
So you don't have to know what all those milestones are that are going to get you to that final destination. You've yeah. just know what your next step is. Yeah. And for me, that's been really helpful because, mm -hmm. I, you know, this time last year, I had no idea that this year I would decide to, to focus on boarding school survivors and relationships. Mm -hmm. I was still doing long COVID and, and ACE, which is, an, you know, boarding school is a form of adverse childhood experience, but mm -hmm. I was being general about it. Yeah, but here I am starting a, a new, pro pretty much a new project. Yeah, and it's like that's what my fog lights are showing me now. Yeah, and that's great. And I think it's important to have like that sliding scale piece, right? Also, yeah. it's important as well to have enough openness to allow for creativity. Absolutely, to allow for curiosity, um, and 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 so yeah, within that. I think that's really important because actually as new things come into your world or new opportunities, you don't want to be like, no, I don't want to collaborate with that person. I don't have space for that. That's not my goal for this six months, you know. You absolutely. Like you spot on. Yes. You want it to be like, oh, let me see. Let, let's have a discussion about how we maybe can discussion. work together. Like always yeah. be open to the curiosity of investigating something without wasting your time in it but yeah I, I mean you might decide after two or three meetings that actually this isn't right for you mm. but if you don't go and have make that initial investigation you're never going to know exactly of course sometimes you might think no i have got so much on my plate i cannot take another project on and that's fine too mm. so i guess it's you know flexibility isn't it curiosity creativity and flexibility yeah i like those Keywords. Yes. Have you read um, Big Magic by Elizabeth? Gordon? I have. I just finished it on Monday. I love it. I love it so that much. I love the piece where um, Elizabeth Gilbert goes into, you know, when you don't know where you're going to go creatively next, then always yes. investigate curiosity. Yes. I love that. And, and her whole piece about how she didn't know what, book to write next after Eat, Pray, Love, because Eat, Pray, Love was her first big, big, big it, book, which was yes. so wonderful and such a blessing that she got that success. But then she went even deeper into um, how is the world going to receive another book from me now? Because, yeah. And if it's if it doesn't follow on from this one or if it isn't as good, and, it, and it's kind of like she once she accepted it doesn't matter if the next book is in as good yes exactly it's okay if it's you know doesn't sell as well yeah then, and it's that whole piece around I mean I love her whole thing and she did a TED talk on it as well around fear and around how yeah. fear could be a passenger but it can't be in the driver's seat yes exactly um, and it's not allowed to even to touch the radio yes that. yes yes I love that I it love is that. You know, the other thing that I was talking about this with, with Mark, my partner, and we both noticed that Prince, the, you know, the musician, he released so many albums. Mm. He, he, everything he recorded, he released. Because there's this thing about the more you do, the better you get at it. Mm -hmm. And you know, don't, don't, be, don't be cutting things off because you don't think they're perfect. Just get them out there anyway. Yeah, yeah. Some of them, because you can't always be sure which ones are going to, and different ones them. will land with different people in different exactly, ways. Exactly, yes. And you know, then you're not yeah, speaking to one so person. You've only got to have a handful of people who think, oh, my God, that's the most amazing thing I've ever heard. And that's enough, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And what's amazing is I, I just love looking at how the universe aligns. You know, I get more spiritual as I get older. But yeah. I don't know if you saw me comment on um, your LinkedIn post last night, but it was so that's tiring. So it was hilarious because I was literally sitting there. It was coming up to seven o'clock at night. And I think, <laughs> do I switch off and go and watch TV and actually enjoy the fact that I've had a restorative day? I've had a spa day with a friend. Mm. And today can actually not be a full on work day. I've caught up with my emails or I could do this task, this task, this task. And I clicked into LinkedIn and literally the first thing that popped up was, I see you, you person who wishes that you turned off at seven and it's actually 
And oh, he actually said off at so- nine and now you're exhausted for the next day. And I was just like, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> that's synchro destiny. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so I'm allowed to end off for me. <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, I thought you'd got into it via the, the WhatsApp group, but no, no you not you? Wow. But I just find it so funny how, you know, I don't know how much woo-woo I believe in, but I do find that messages come to me, which I need to hear. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I yeah. quite often repeat on me from different sources, like advertising on bus stops and like, Jill, do this thing. And I'm like, okay, then. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, once you've heard it three or four times, you know it's, it's a, really a loud message, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's like, You've got to pay attention. It's fascinating, really. So I think that's a really great format for working out actual intentionality and goals. And also this whole piece around accepting the time to hibernate and and rest and everything is so important. And again, you know, you get that from several different sources. Like a book I read a couple of months ago was um, The Little Book of Huga which is all about <laughs> you know the um Denmark Denmark yes it is so. Denmark. um so it's the concept of obviously they have such a big part of the year where they have pretty much no mm-hmm. sun and it yeah. is basically like our grey January times 10 for them <laughs> <laughs> they've literally just gone right well we'll just stay in and have lots of candles and yeah. lots of warm food and yeah and do lots of nurturing like we'll all contribute to the food and we'll eat and we'll celebrate it you know the other amazing book if you haven't read it is wintering okay and she i forget what it was now she has some some illness um which made her slow right down and her husband and her son had various problems as well i think around the same kind of time and then she started researching how winter is is honoured in different countries in the northern mm. hemisphere, and um, and she just—it's the same thing. It's about rest and replenishment, and 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 going with the season rather than fighting it. Yeah, I think yeah. that's one of the things to me is when I recognise there's no good. It's no good fighting winter. It's not no, winter because you're fighting it. Just yeah. go the flow and go to bed earlier and spend more time drinking hot cho- I've got a big thing about hot chocolate in the winter. Yeah. You know, we've had some quite lovely sunny days here in Bedford and mm. I've had some lovely walks in the park and in the cemetery. Mm. It's really weird. And you can go in there and you can immerse yourself in birdsong because it's really quiet and, and start to, because I'm slowing myself down, I'm starting to hear... Oh, that was a different version of that one. Oh my god, there are two of them in this opposite of the cemetery. And okay. they're singing. And it's like a little kind of mini orchestra of different kind, kinds of birds. I love it. I love all the slow movements which are coming out and the mindfulness. It's all connected. Yes. It's all connected. All it's like yeah. let's slow down. Let's question what we're buying, why we're buying. Let's question what we're doing. Let's give ourselves the breathing space. Let's do breath work. Let's you know yes. do all these things and have let's schedule time for rest. Well, <laughs> this absolutely, is what we so desperately need as a society. There's another one which was again on Glenn and Doyle's podcast from um, something called the Nap Ministry. And she's huh. um, she's worth a look. I think she's just brought out a book as well. And it all is about the power of rest and yes. how that is the antidote to white supremacy and capitalism. And um, <laughs> like it's that. just like, you know, all these things which we think that we have to do, like go, 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 next step, next step, next step. You know, the whole mm. structure of the employed world versus yes. the advanced world is like my experience of this annual review I always hated annual reviews where you had to <laughs> go back and statistically look at your previous year and then well what do you do want to do next in your career and if you were in a space as I was where I was like I'm quite happy with doing the job I'm doing it fits around my family life 
Oh, mm-hmm. Don't you want to do something more? Something more? Something more? And yes. It's, like, it's so goes in steps. So you just you just want to kind of go a long level for a bit, consolidate, and then it's time to go to something different because actually now I'm getting bored. Yeah. And and you know you've probably gone to a little cycle of slowing down and resting, mm-hmm. and reflecting and thinking and, and watch light and wondering and curiosity, and then move up to the, whatever it might be. And that could be promotion or it could be a different job or it could be going solo. And There's no shame in sidestepping, you know. I'm actually too, very yes. comfortable in that space of sidestepping into something just as interesting on the same level, you know. It doesn't always yeah, that too. take on more responsibility, take on more things. No, I think it, sometimes sidestepping is like, you know, you're going to acquire new skills. Mm. You're going to be creating different part, areas of life. So it's a different kind of more. Mm-hmm. Actually, my friend Claire, who is a, um, well, she's not anymore, but for five years she was a Unitarian minister in South London. When she did her training to become a minister, um, one of the, I think he was a Jesuit actually, who, this guy, he he talked about the more. Mm. It's that the divine is more than anything we could ever understand or conceive. And yet we mm-hmm. are part of it. Mm. And so to be constantly looking for that kind of more, as opposed to, you know, more money, mm. more cars or whatever, but just more, I don't know, experience, more depth, more connection. Those mores are the mores I want in my life. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I think this whole thing of the hibernation period is so important to this because yes. you're actually taking the time to question all the different things which you want yeah. like actually question what is success to us what is value oh, absolutely. to us you know it's not necessarily all about monetary value it's about breaking that down sometimes and going well actually I feel like my cup is filled up by having these wonderful conversations with really yeah. interesting people on my podcast and I don't get paid for that time but I value that time and I value their time in talking to me and us yes. teaching our audience together and how wonderful that is. And, and you know, and also having the belief that things will come to you when they need to come to you. And, and, and we, yes. I think that's an important part of goal setting as well. And I think this is, uh, just delve into this a little bit intentions are great and goals obviously are specific measurables but what if you don't meet the goals which you set to meet that year how do you not frame that negatively you've learned how not to do something yeah you know like thomas edison famously said i i forget what the figure was but you know i've learned 160 ways not to make a light bulb yeah, yeah, I've heard that quote. Yeah. Zero is a that number. And so you've tried something and it didn't work. Mm. So you know not to do that and you again or to or to tweak it or adjust it. Yeah. Maybe you've learned that actually that wasn't what you wanted anyway. Particularly if you didn't check your values, first of all. Yeah. I mean, I am an innate planner. I am someone who, and I've learned this about myself, that I enjoy the process of the plan. And it makes me feel more in control of the future. Yeah. But what I've learned through time is that I get enough out of that planning process that it almost doesn't matter so much if those plans come to fruition exactly mm-hmm. as I intend them to. It's important for me to plan so I can get my head around it and go through that process. Yeah. You know, I'll give the example of the birth plan, which I knew going into that with my midwife it will more than likely sit in my bag. It will more than likely not actually, I won't get to play a playlist whilst I'm having a C-section or whatever. But bless her soul, she was incredible. (laughs) She sat with me for over an hour in my house while I asked her every possible question about what a C-section was and what the possible side effects were and, you know, how it might feel and all these different things. And that was so important to me. And I actually ended up writing a blog post about it and saying to people, 
it is this interesting thing because you know the national child care trust encourages women to write a birth plan yeah but, they do. but and but actually if you then said it most likely won't happen that way but this is your important process to get your yeah, head around I, what I it think it is birth and ask all those questions and get do you know what I mean and I think also it gives you a it gives you a sense of having some degree of control over the process yeah um and I know from a long a long time ago I came across some research which showed that women who experience very little control in childbirth are much more likely to end up with postnatal depression yeah so you know, even though you it may not go according to your plan, mm. at least you had a plan. At least yeah. you had intentions around how you're, and you uh, ask the questions. And I kind of say, and this is the thing with I think the birth plan is an interesting example actually, because to me, it's almost like birth intentions, and then the mm. layer on top of that is I say fundamentally the most important thing is you get that baby out of you in the safest way for both you and the baby. And that is, yeah, I don't know what you would call that level, but that is kind of the mission statement, which <laughs> surpasses the plan. You know, it's just like, if it's actually in the moment you need pain relief, which you didn't think you were going to need, then sod it, have it, you know, yeah. do what you need to do. To get the baby out safely. And I think it's about having a choice. It's about recognising you have a choice. Yeah. And don't, you know, don't let your birth plan take away your choice. Yeah. 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 Even you wrote it yourself. You know, you wrote that maybe a week or a month beforehand. And you're not going to say, oh, well, I, I, I've got to stick to my birth plan, come what may, because then you've taken your choice. Yeah. And it's counterintuitive. That's not what the purpose was. No, exactly. Yeah, that's funny. That's really interesting. Yeah, I think this is a good way to sort of round things up, actually. Your own personal and coaching journey to this mm -hmm. point in your life, what mm -hmm. are the best resources which have helped you along the way? Oh, absolutely. Just the, the three principles. So All the right. three principles. The three principles are a a model, shall we say? Yeah. Started with a guy called Sid Banks. He was a Scottish welder who lived in Canada. Okay. And he just had this enlightenment experience, and he had this realization about what we are and and how we how we function. Yeah. And and the whole of this stuff around you know personality being separate from the the actual true self. Yeah. Yeah, that all comes I mean that also comes from other traditions as well. He he's not got a monopoly on it. No, no. Yeah. But he kind of stripped it right down to the basics. And, and so he he said there were three principles. He called them the three principles. And the three principles are the truth of who we really are, um, how our experience is created. And the final thing is that once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. So I was using the example of spectacles. If you notice that your glasses are a bit grubby and you take them off and clean them yeah. and then put them back on again, you're not going to make the mistake of thinking that your clean glasses are the grubby ones. Yeah. You will know that those are clean glasses. So even though I I might find myself thinking, oh, I, uh, for instance, I'm anxious because I didn't earn any money, any, didn't earn any money last month, for instance. Mm. That's not true. Mm. I'm anxious. And then my anxiety is looking for a place to hang itself. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I've, so once I've recognised that I've been tricked into the what, what's called the outside-in misunderstanding, and I remember, oh, no, 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 it doesn't work that way. It's mm -hmm. all inside that. I know that then I've got my split, clean spectacles on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. That does sound fascinating. That sounds wonderful. I love that. I mean, I, um, I can give you a book recommendation. Yeah, I mean, if you can email me any books for further reading, I like. I will do that. that. 
Do you want to just um, talk into what you've got going on at the moment and what you've got coming up and where people can find you really, Sorrel? That would be lovely. Okay, so the big the big thing that I'm doing is working on this um, project for boarding school survivors mm-hmm. around relationships and probably women. And the two joint projects, the one with John, John Britton, who is another boarding school survivor, where we're going to be doing a joint group coaching program. And then the one with my friend Julie Fenn, who does embodiment coaching. And we both trained, we're both three principles coaches. We both be trained together. And we're going to be doing this, pro- this thing on boundaries and saying no. She's got a great no pose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and then obviously the one-to-one work. And I'm also working on an online course. It's on post-traumatic growth. Okay. I could give you some links for So that's a course you're doing. I'm actually building it. I'm in you're the building, building it, it for other people to do. Right? Yeah. yeah. And when it's built, yeah. be some online modules and group coaching sessions on a sort of weekly basis. Yeah, lovely. But I think the fact that we broke down how to set goals with intention yeah I think that will be really helpful for people and and to also take the pressure off yourself you don't need to do it for January the 1st you know it's very oh, no. don't yeah, do I just, that you almost. set yourself up for failure if you do it yeah first and why yeah. would anyone want to do that yeah pay attention to the seasons around you pay attention yeah. to what nature's doing and come alive in spring yeah absolutely Thank you so much for your time, Sorrel. I really appreciate it. it. And I look forward to getting this podcast out there. Thank you. Uh, And we'll connect again soon. Thank you for your time. Have a great rest of your day. Yeah, you too. Take care, Jill. Bye. Bye.